thank you very much. The Star Wars um, opens the moonshot for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you, my dear friends and uh, colleagues. For, I'm so pleased to welcome welcoming you at the 25th um, European Health Forum here in the Gastein. After two years of online meetings, finally we are back in the valley. What a good feeling, what a good feeling. And we also have almost a thousand participants virtually with us since we're doing this in a hybrid format. So a welcome to each and one of you, regardless in which physical state you are with us. Altogether, we are almost 1,400 participants. That's also a new record uh, for the European Health Forum. Dear friends, a moonshot for a true European health union, if not now, when? Um, when we, the board, uh, Dolly and her team, the advisory committee, uh, decided on this uh, main topic 10 months ago, uh, we all were full of enthusiasm. Truly, we were full of enthusiasm. How difficult and uh, how challenging the COVID-19 pandemic might have been, and no doubt, uh, these were challenging times for millions of patients around the world and many hundreds and thousands of healthcare workers. But on the bright side, for us in the health systems, health policies were elevated in lofty heights. Uh, the significance and um, the importance of our work was never more exposed and depreciated. All doors were suddenly open. Uh, and some of us might even remember the late Queen uh, gave a little speech, a televised speech, uh, talking about uh, health and healthcare and the pandemic challenges. But that was the background for us to take this decision. We wanted to fill up the half empty glass and finish the goal to reach a European health union, a true European health union. The skeptics, the naysayers among lawyers in the capitals and elsewhere did not have good cards to stop us. And 2021 and 2022 were good years in the international field of health policies. We established a new financing system at the World Health, Health Assembly for the World Health Organization, a big step forwards. We were able to improve some governing structures in the governing bodies of the World Health Organization when it comes for better preparedness, uh, pre prevention, preparedness and response in case of uh, pandemic situations. Intergovernmental negotiations started on a legally binding new instrument for better preparedness. In the European Union, we started the HERA, this health emergency response agency, and the Recovery and Resilience Fund um, has also quite a bit of money separated or reserved for, for health financing. The goal was clear. The goal was clear. Never, never again did we want to be ill-prepared to stumble like daydreamers into a public health crisis of international concern. The crisis is catharsis, a challenge to do things better, to start all over smarter. But the top of all these crises had not even sneaked around the corner back when we just made these decisions. February 20, 24th, for our generation, and I think I can speak for everyone in the room, the almost unthinkable has happened. An aggressive war in Ukraine, in the middle of Europe, and a war we learned very, very quickly has many, many horrible siblings. Death, atrocities, destruction, anxieties, mental health stress, food shortages, hunger, and the list of these siblings of war is very long, a very long list. And with the energy crisis and the inflation comes another level of this crisis, of this perma-crisis. And we all know what that means. 
inflation, social and economic instability, and we all might experience social unrest in the next 12 to 24, uh, 12 to 24 months. The dwindling away of money means practically cutting budgets, health budgets, and it's not only that the energy prices are rising, probably many, many people will not be able to afford payments for the medicines, maybe even not the fees for the health insurance. Nobody at the European Health Forum here needs this wake-up call. The opposite, we are all in the middle of this crisis, perma-crisis. Each and every aspect of this perma-crisis has a devastating or a negative determinant effect on health. We all need, we all know that. And on top of that, and I'm very sorry, this list of negative news is not stopping. We already have a health workforce which is at the end of its physical and mental power. Even in this country here, hospital departments are closing every day because enough is enough. The stress is overwhelming. And I might even guess that the health workforce crisis may be for us in the health systems the largest of these elements of a perma crisis. Friends, this plenary session will help us to give us some orientation to, ma to master this uh, perma crisis before it all turns into a doomsday prognosis. We, de we do need orientation and we do need a clear vision how we can get out of this. And uh, let us start with the big picture. Let's frame it large. And I'm very proud and pleased to have to help us to give us orientation to main figures on the European scene when it comes to health. I'm very proud and happy that the regional director of WHO, Hans Kluge, is among us, and I would like to <clears throat> ask you up here, and also the Commissioner for Health and Consumer Protection, Stella Kyriakides. Welcome, and please help us and give us some clear orientation how we can get out of this crisis. <clears throat> Hans, I might start with you, and um, since you're in a position of the regional director, uh, and you can, the, you have the power to coordinate, to bring people together, um, and tell people what to do, what are the most promising uh, activities underway to bring us out of this perma crisis before we all fall in deep depression? First and foremost, congratulations, President Ower, for getting us, many of us, physically together. I think we're all very much looking forward to that one, and thank you also, Dorley, and your team. So a week ago, we had our annual governing board, the Regional Committee in Tel Aviv, where I presented the new normal, which I called dual track. It means that all countries should be able to maintain constant readiness and alert to emergencies, because as Clement says, we're in perma crisis, but without breaking routine disease prevention and control. And the three priorities we discussed in Tel Aviv is number one, a strong primary healthcare movement, because pandemics are not one in the hospitals, they're one in the communities, with integrated mental health care and digital, number one. Number two, investment in the health workforce. We launched our first European report on status of health and care workforce in the region. 40% of our doctors are close to retirement age. In many countries, nine out of 10 nurses would like to leave the workforce. So we have a big issue over there. Number three is to strengthen scientific rigor. Less Twitter in WHO and more scientific excellence. Because abandoning science is a slippery slope. And it is unacceptable that our scientists have to fear for their lives and the lives of their families being harassed and attacked also in this country. Tragically, 
And this means we have to get some trust back. I am advocating that we include in the PERMA crisis non-communicable diseases. In COVID-19 times, five times more people died at a younger average age from cardiovascular pandemic, heart attacks and strokes than COVID-19 at its worst. Nothing kills more people in our region than hypertension. 2.4 million people a year. And we're doing a terrible job on preventing and managing hypertension. I just came back from Kazakhstan, where I attended a meeting of all ministers of health of the CIS countries. And it was clear we should not forget about HIV. HIV has to be included in the PERMA crisis. It's very politically convenient to get it off the political agenda and talk more on pandemic and TB because it needs greater efforts to reach target populations. Men having sex with men, LGBT, transgender, sex workers and their sexual partners. So we need the political commitment. Finally, how to do it? You know that the European program of work is built on the pillar of partnership. We strongly believe in working together. I think it was very clear at the United Nations General Assembly this week by many, many heads of state. And here I would like to thank the Commissioner for our great collaboration. I think this has also undergone a transformation. Thank you so much, dear Commissioner, dear Stella. Collaboration with HERA, you mentioned, with ECDC. We saw it with the monkeypox. There is a solidarity to the Balkan, to the Eastern Partnership. So we're learning the lessons. But what we need as Europe is the solidarity globally. And that's why the EU Global Health Strategy is so important. I'm in a regular touch with my sister, the Regional Director of the African Region, Dr. Moweti, great Regional Director, doing a great job. We can learn a lot from the South, but we also have to stand in solidarity, not at least in equal sharing of vaccines. Thank you, Hans. Um, Madam Commissioner, dear Stella, I'm very happy and uh, that you're with us virtually. Uh, see, that's, that's the advantage of having hybrid formats. Even if you're not able to travel, we can lock you in a little bit for us and share your wisdom. Madam and uh, Commissioner, thank you for that. Um, see, I have a very simple question to you. You know, this brutal war in Ukraine had uh, so drastic consequences and impact, a negative impact for so many Ukrainians. And this is our neighborhood, you know, it's, it's uh, I don't have to say backyard, but it's really our neighborhood. And patients need access to all, all sorts of treatments and there's a lot of disruption. And um, uh, Commissioner, what has the European Union done to ease this, this tremendous burden and the tremendous threats these people, the people in the Ukraine are experiencing? And once again, thank you for being with us. Help us to find a way out of this perma crisis. First of all, good afternoon to everyone, uh, to uh, Dr. Hans Kluger, a, a very, very close colleague and collaborator from the very beginning of my, my mandate. Thank you uh, for bringing us together and good afternoon to, uh, to the minister who I was able to also see earlier. Uh, you're absolutely right that uh, we are dealing with uh, a very brutal and illegal uh, invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And from day one, the EU uh, reacted uh, with both solidarity and with support. Uh, I personally have traveled to Ukraine. I visited Lviv in, uh, a few months ago. And from the very beginning, I have been in regular contact with Minister um, Lashko because it was important that we were able to understand what their needs were to see how we could support them. Um, I think this, this uh, kind of uh, destruction that we're seeing of the health system of Ukraine, with specifically hospitals being uh, targets of attack, with access to health care being so impacted uh, by security concerns, you can only have uh, a, address these needs if you have very close collaboration, uh, if you have a picture of what is available on the ground, but also uh, working across. So, well, for example, we work together with, of course, WHO, we work together with the International Red Cross. You need everyone to work together in order to be able to really address the needs. 
Now, under the EU civil protection mechanism, the EU member states and other countries are supporting Ukraine with emergency assistance to a level that uh, I believe we haven't seen before. We're delivering medicines, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, ambulances, food, shelter. And so far, the estimated value of this assistance is about 433 million euro. And I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone, everyone, the member states, civil society, uh, individuals for their contribution and solidarity. One of our key um, issues from the beginning was the, how we could transport uh, patients um, who couldn't be treated in Ukraine out of Ukraine and into, the, into member states that would be uh, able to support the treatment they needed. And we set up a medical evacuation system. So far, more than 1,300 patients, most of them severely wounded because of the war, have been flown to uh, 18 uh, EU and EA countries in order to receive uh, special treatment. And last week, uh, I met the Ukrainian First Lady when we were in Strasbourg, and she also highlighted the need uh, of mental health, which you yourself men mentioned, the post-traumatic stress that many, many citizens are facing, and that we know that uh, a war like this uh, results in. Therefore, mental health and trauma are, of course, are among our priorities, and uh, through eu for health uh, we are able to support projects for mental health with so far over uh, 11 million being available. So um, I, I'll just stop here, but I just want to also say that as this war goes on, the, the needs are also changing day by day. So we need to have this close collaboration horizontally, continuously to see where we're going to direct our support for people with disabilities, for people needing prosthetics, people needing mental health. Uh, and um, I'm very happy that you gave us this opportunity and we can highlight um, the, the, not only the work that we are trying to do uh, within the EU, but also the very close um, coordination and collaboration we have with uh, our partners, um, such as uh, Dr. Hans Kruger, who I want to thank for always being available so that we can exchange and really give support where it is needed. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Hans, you know, 2020, early 2020, we probably all woke up and found out that we are not that well prepared for a public health emergency of international concern, as we all should be. And I'm long enough in the business that I do know that we all tried hard to prepare, but we, we are not well enough prepared. Do you think that the World Health Organization is now better prepared 2022 than it was 2020? And that is probably also true for the members of the World Health Organization. So, you know, Clemens, I'm uh, an optimist by nature to looking at the glass half full or half empty. At least we know what to do. There has been the report of the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development to rethink policies in the light of pandemics. The Monti Commission, there has been the Commission of the IPPR, Independent Panel for Preparedness and uh, Review, and we have Professor Kibush uh, with uh, us here. So the what is quite clear. One, for example, is One Health. There in the region, I would say, we have a clear roadmap. I signed with the three regional directors of FAO, the World Organization Animal Health, and also on the uh, Environment, UNEP, the agreements and we have a way forward, there will be a ministerial, the five-year ministerial conference mid-year next year in Budapest. And we just got the news that the president of Hungary will be the patron of the conference. So that's well said. Basically, Clemens, I think there were two key issues during this uh, pandemic. One is the alert system. Every country should be able to quickly pick up through its surveillance if there is a threat within seven days. And that's why I'm quite uh, satisfied and happy that by the Region Committee, we got the mandate to establish a pan-European network of disease control, which in a couple of weeks in Stockholm, I will discuss with my good collaborator, Dr. Andrea Amund, this one. But that's not enough, because when WHO declared the pandemic, it took many countries weeks before to take action. So there is a need for a revised global and regional health architecture 
We have a very strong role of the regional offices because to do everything centralized is from an outdated governance. We are close to the countries. And here, the intergovernment negotiations on the legally binding pandemic treaty is so important. We would like to encourage you to be very proactive. But what's the real elephant in the room? I mean, the real elephant in the room, we know, Clemens, is how much decisional independence the countries want to give up to the multilateral agency in terms of shared vaccine distribution, independent external missions, in terms of border and travel regulations and surveillance. This is really the key issue, I would say. I told you I just came from uh, Kazakhstan, so I'm still a little bit in the Central Asian mood, also because of the tiredness. So there was a very nice proverb from Central Asia that you don't choose your house, but you choose your neighbors. You don't choose the road, but you choose your accompagnant de route. And I think the multilateralism is much more important than ever before. You can see that, like with the polio, a crisis anywhere, like in New York, becomes immediately a crisis everywhere from Jerusalem to Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Um, <laughs> Madam Commissioner, we love to talk about a stronger European Union, but health was never that strong on the agenda of the European Union. And we here in the European Health Forum, we even talk now about uh, uh, expecting a moonshot for a true European Health Union. Um, are we dreamers? What is your participation or your contribution to this moonshot to reach this European Health Union? And is that the answer to tackle the perma crisis? First of all, I'll take from uh, where what Hans uh, said about seeing the glass uh, half empty or half full. And uh, like Hans, I, o I always uh, see the glass half full. But we're definitely not dreamers. We would be dreamers if uh, what uh, we wanted to aim for for a European Health Union was not already in action, was not already happening. Um, we are already seeing changes um, as a result of, uh, of the last uh, almost now three years of, of a pandemic. Um, we are building a stronger framework for cross-border cooperation. By the end of this current year, we will have two pieces of legislation being adopted. Uh, we have already reinforced ECDC and EMA, their mandates, because we saw that they did incredible work during the pandemic, but we, we needed to reinforce their mandates. Um, and uh, you mentioned at the very beginning that we already have uh, in place uh, our new authority, HERA, which has dramatically changed um, the way we respond to existing to, to threats, but also to existing ones. For example, the way it has worked not only for COVID-19, but monkeypox and, of course, Ukraine. Um, I, the, the pandemic hasn't, uh, is not over, and I will continuously say this because I, I also have the, the feeling, as uh, Hans, I'm sure, does as well, that we feel that this is over. Unfortunately, this pandemic has taught us that uh, it, uh, situation is also always very unpredictable. But what has changed dramatically is the way we approach it in terms of the availability of vaccines. Um, and I will pick up the baton from what Hans said, that uh, in the area of vaccines, the EU vaccine strategy is a success that we can speak of, a success story. But this cannot just be about the EU. Uh, we have seen clearly that oh, preparedness and response is a global concern. So we are working to strengthen our role in international cooperation. And uh, we have called for reform of the international health cooperation. Um, and also we are working towards finding other solutions uh, through our pharmaceutical strategy, our cancer plan, and the European health data space. It's um, very important to stress that the seek the secret to this success is collaboration. Uh, you spoke about uh, a, 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 a moonshot. 
uh, I'd say one thing, in order to be able to, to land on the moon, you need to have everyone on board. The commission, the agencies, the society groups, the stakeholders, our international partners, the member states, to be able to, to, to bring the right, uh, the right results. Um, and uh, to come back to where you started, health was never a priority. Well, I believe that there is a real paradigm shift now, and health is a priority. It's definitely a member state's competence, no question of that. But through solidarity and collaboration, we have shown how much stronger we are as a European health union when we work together. Thank you. Very encouraging. Hans, finally, um, you are in constant uh, crisis mode. Um, I think uh, since you took office, uh, everything every day was probably somehow a crisis management. What is your takeaway message? What is your moonshot, so to say? How would you like to, to, to improve us all to land at the moon? So I see two dimensions, Clemens. I mean, the big one, the big moonshot is peace. Every day I pray for peace. But praying is not enough, and that's why I appeal on everyone to avoid fatigue. The people in Ukraine need the support. 10 October, I will go for the fourth time to Ukraine with my good friend, the minister, Dr. Viktor Lashko, to Odessa, Dnipro, Poltava, Kiev, to assist in winterization. The winter can be a big enemy. So we need the solidarity there. So peace is the overarching. And then on the pandemic preparedness, I would say, that our Ministers of Finance and Economy got so traumatized by the pandemic that they start to see health threats in the same order as nuclear threats and double investment in the health workforce. Very good word. Commissioner, let, me, let, let us finish this uh, very, very uh, co uh, fruitful conversation, and we probably could go on for hours and hours. But you know, as I mentioned in my little introductory speech, you know, we are lo the next big crisis is looming, the crisis for the health workforce and, and, and many other aspects for in, within the health systems all of a sudden now, even in established health systems within the European Union. So what would you do to, uh, for the moonshot to have a safe moon landing when it comes to tackle these kind of crises, which are really at the heart of the health systems? Building resilience and stronger health systems is uh, very clear that this is what we need to focus on, and the pandemic has shown us this. Um, and as you said, from the beginning of our, of our mandates and with hands, we've been really dealing uh, in, in, a, in a crisis mode. Uh, but I, I think, I believe that we need to, to use everything that we have at our disposal uh, in order to be able to tackle this. Uh, for example, we have uh, the European Health Data Space that we launched uh, in order to, to use the digital um, uh, health data and encourage digital health, because this can really revolutionize the way that we, we look at, at, at health. And um, I, I want to, to really say that uh, ultimately the one wish that we, should all, we all want is, is peace. Uh, wars have um, huge consequences at all levels and so much human suffering. Uh, but we are, as an EU, are in there for the long haul to support Ukraine. Uh, and we need to be prepared for more difficult autumn and winter months. And the, what I would say is that what we need to really uh, be prepared for is that we need to build uh, stronger and more resilient health systems and never forget the, the backbone of those health systems, which is the health working force um, in, 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 when, we're, when we're moving ahead. Uh, so uh, we will uh, land on, on the moon um, if we are ambitious, if we are pragmatic, and if we deliver concrete benefits, demonstrating clearly to citizens in the EU that health is a number one priority. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Commissioner. Um, 
And I think both of you um, helped us to, to understand the situation a little bit better and not to fall into a, um, a next crisis, into a depression crisis. That would not be good because we do need our strengths and intelligence <clears throat> to tackle the crisis and to solve the problems ahead. Thank you very much, both of you. We are very honored that you are with us. Uh, and I hand over to Nick Fahi now because uh, he is moderating the second part of this uh, uh, plenary session. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well done, gentlemen. Yeah. Thank you, Clemens. Thank you, Dr. Kluger and Madam Commissioner. And good afternoon, everybody. Let me add my welcome as well to Gastein and reinforce, Hans, as you said, the pleasure that it is to be back in the Valley for those of us who are all here. And my thanks uh, to Clemens, to Dorley, and to everyone involved in the organization uh, for doing this, for bringing us all together, and for reminding us just how important it is, especially in these times of a perma crisis for us to come together and for us to benefit from not just the content of the discussions that we have in Gastein, but also from the sense of resilience that we have from the network and from the connections that this European Health Forum Gastein creates for those of us here in the Valley and for everyone online. My name's Nick Fahey. I'm the director of the Health and Wellbeing Research Group at RAND Europe. We are an independent research organization and hands. We aim to do exactly what you uh, emphasized as one of your three priorities, to bring rigorous evidence and science in support of policy making and decision making. And I was delighted to hear that as one of your three priorities. And I'm rest assured that we and everyone else from the research pillar, and I'm sure every pillar here will in gash time will be aiming to support you in that and the other priorities you and the commissioner set out. Colleagues, I'm sure that We've already had reactions and you've, you've, you've been prompted in thoughts and reflections by the important contributions that we've already had. So let me tell you about some ways in which you can express those. Please tweet using the hashtag uh, EHFG2022. We have a word cloud. Uh, we will um, set that uh, going and we will invite you to make your contributions to that work cloud and we'll have an opportunity to pick that up in a little bit. We have also, and for those of you who are familiar with the, with the Gastein Health Forum, you'll be familiar with this. You'll be familiar with Floris's cartoons, which he will be doing during this. I'm sure you've already had some, some thoughts from what's been discussed already, and we'll look forward to seeing what you've taken out of this a bit later on. And Nicolene Tansma is here as well, and who will be running our, our newsroom, mod, uh, taking these different interactions from the poll, from the word cloud, and and bringing them up to us, and we'll have an opportunity to reflect on those as we go through. We're going to continue now with a panel of, as you can see, very distinguished speakers who reflect the range of the challenges, Clemens, that you already described, but who I'm sure are also going to bring a note of hope and optimism about how we move on through this. But before we do that, I would like uh, us to be able to hear from some equally eminent and distinguished speakers, uh, that is the Young Forum Gastein. Uh, and so if we can, I'd like to hear from those speakers now. I am most concerned by the climate emergency. Governments must invest in economies and societies that put the health and well-being of people at the heart. Addressing the corporate activities that shape physical and social environments negatively is an important place to start. We need urgent political action to support all people, especially those who are mostly affected by the climate catastrophe, hunger and worse. 
I am mostly worried about the impact of the perma crisis in what used to be our European health policy planning cycles. I think our usual model of planning, acting, and evaluating uh, the results of our interventions may not be as easy to implement when we are jumping from one crisis to the other. I am most concerned about the war in Ukraine. My Ukrainian friends told me that living under these conditions directly affects the mental health of many people in the country. We need urgent action to stop the war and to help those who are directly affected. The Burma crisis is one of the major challenges of our times. It would be advisable to get deeper insights into the potential role of healthcare professionals, such as pharmacies, when a disaster takes place in order to ensure communities that have access to medicines. My biggest worry is the impact of the crisis on inequalities. We need strong mechanisms that would prevent the rich to get richer, and we need to ensure healthy living environments for all. I am most concerned about the global shortage of health workforces. We need urgent action to recruit, train and retain our health workers now in order to face today and tomorrow's health challenges affecting our societies. Due to the war in Ukraine and the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, Europe is living in a very uncertain time. However, we must ensure that we leave no one behind. And when I say so, I think of the patient community, especially those living with chronic diseases, who must receive the care they need. For me, there is not one aspect that worries me the most. It's the mix. The war in Ukraine and the associated danger of a nuclear catastrophe climate crisis which, compared to a 38 degree fever, makes you sick both climatically and health-wise, and also the uncertainty about inflation is scary. These problems are man-made, but I don't see us addressing them sufficiently. A true European Health Union depends on how and what level should each competence, action and function be delivered to assure cost-effective interventions and access quality and affordable care to all uh, European citizens and beyond. In order to fulfill these goals, a dynamic and cooperative one shot is the challenge of our generation. Striking messages. That illustrates the sheer range of the challenges that we're facing and the breadth of the topics that we should be discussing. I'm not going to say that our, uh, our guests have the challenge of addressing all of those issues, but they are going to give us very important and valued contributions. And I would like to invite um, Abigail and Natalie to come up to this, to come up and join me on the stage now. Um, as you wish, ladies. <laughs> so we have had quite a broad introduction of topics here. And I think within the Health Forum, and I'll turn to you first, Abigail, as um, Abigail Perry is the director of the Nutrition Division for the World Food Programme. I think we've seen the range of issues that, uh, the range of challenges that affect health and the extent to which they face beyond what we think of as the core health system. Um, and the war in Ukraine is battering a global food system which is already weakened by COVID-19, the climate crisis and energy shortages. What are the impacts that you're seeing um, and in the global south and which regions are you most concerned about at the moment? Thanks very much. Um, so the World Food Programme is the largest humanitarian organisation in the world and we're very used to acting at scale. But as you rightly say, the impacts of COVID-19, climate and conflict are creating a, an unprecedented level of need this year. So we're currently experiencing 345 million people in 82 countries who are facing acute food insecurity. Uh, this is uh, more than double what we were facing before the COVID-19 pandemic. So we have five countries at the moment that are basically on the brink of famine, experiencing famine risk um, context. So this is Afghanistan, Ethiopia, uh, South Sudan, um, Somalia, and Yemen. Apologies, the five were recorded into my head up until this point in time. So there are 970,000 people in those, uh, in those settings um, who, without humanitarian support, are really at the brink of, um, of uh, extraordinarily uh, disruptive situations to their lives. 
Um, what we saw in the Somalia famine in 2011 was, was uh, 258,000 excess deaths, um, half of which are among children under the age of five. So we're seeing an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily severe situation uh, in these contexts right now. But with the, continued, uh, the continuation of uh, all of these pressures and the, and the forces that are exerting real challenges on these different countries, we're also seeing more and more countries facing an extraordinarily high level of risk. So we're particularly concerned at the moment about the countries in the Sahel region, uh, Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Haiti, and Sudan. Uh, but honestly, there are more and more countries where we're seeing affordability of healthy diets uh, and levels of malnutrition uh, starting to rise. The estimates are that by the end of this year, we'll have 60 million children under the age of five facing acute malnutrition, compared to 47 million that we saw uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic. So as I said, we're really dealing with an extraordinary high level of need, and the, the legacy of this will be lifelong for the populations that we are uh, supporting. Mm. And what is the, what's being done from the EU perspective? Um, what are we doing in terms of assistance for the Global South and, and what would you like to see being done? So, I mean, the first thing to note from the EU side, um, since the global food crisis emerged, um, we have seen a significant focus on this through the European Council and recognizing the need for policy action um, and a discussion of, the, of the, uh, the support that's needed. There's been very welcome support for the G7 initiative led by Germany, uh, but also for um, efforts to accelerate European initiatives which are trying to support improve food production and deal with some of the um, agricultural productivity challenges that are having knock-on effects uh, in the countries where we're working. There's been some very generous financial contributions as well, um, and that's both on the humanitarian side, so to deal with the immediate needs, uh, but also when it comes to um, supporting countries as uh, they're aiming to recover and protect uh, agricultural production, livelihoods in the longer run. Now, in terms of the things that we still need to see, um, there are three areas that I would like to highlight. Uh, so the first is a continuation of a theme on funding. Um, the, the, the budget for the World uh, Food Programme this year is $24 billion. At the moment, we have $10 billion to be able to respond to the needs that we're facing. So funding both in the short term, but also to help countries recover, this, this challenge isn't going anywhere, uh, is going to be incredibly, incredibly important. And noting that a failure to address these high levels of uh, food insecurity in the poorest areas of the world does create an enormous threat in terms of uh, instability. Um, so whether you're concerned about the direct impacts on very vulnerable people or indeed about destabilizing uh, very critical regions, we need to keep funding flowing. The second area is to actually make sure that we're elevating this issue of how the last couple of years have revealed um, the, the weaknesses in the global food system. We talk about it quite a bit, and last year the UN Food System Summit gave focus to certain dimensions of the vulnerabilities in the food system. But just in the way that we're talking about health systems and the way that they need to be protected and strengthened to deal with the future pandemic, we need to ensure that there is action on this issue of our very vulnerable global food system. And the final thing that I, I think is super important, and I think people in this room and online can really help with, is to ensure that as we look at that issue of the, the, the global food system, that we put health and equity as two incredibly important dimensions. Mm -hmm. Food systems mean a lot of things. They mean jobs, they mean livelihoods, they mean economic development. But if we don't ensure that they're actually enabling healthy populations where no one is left behind, then we're really not gonna see a pathway out of a situation where we face, on the one hand, a child in Somalia who is at the brink of death because of malnutrition and populations who are facing economic insecurity because non-communicable diseases are meaning that they are struggling to work and to remain healthy. So a healthy, equitable food system is absolutely fundamental as we move forward. Thank you very much, Abigail. Um, and that is an illustration of a, of a global challenge and of a global contribution and a global response. Um, Nathalie Berger, your uh, Director for Support to Member States Reforms in the Directorate General for Structural Reform Support in the European Commission. And your challenge is to respond to some of these multi-dimensional needs within the European Union. 
What is DG Reform doing to support member states through this PERMA crisis that we've been hearing about? Thank you, Nick. While Commissioner Kyriakides has been presenting some of the measures that the European Commission has adopted and set in place to bring direct assistance to Ukraine following the Russian invasion. In DG Reform, the Commission Directorate General for Structural Reform Support, we have been providing immediate assistance to the member states to face the challenges created by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So we are supporting 17 member states uh, to um, reduce their dependence on uh, Russian uh, fossil fuel and to identify and launch the investments that will be necessary in order to launch and to develop renewable energy sources. We have also uh, provided support to the member states uh, for uh, the migration crisis, so to facilitate the integration of uh, uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, to uh, the education and to the labor market. And we have assisted, we are assisting member states um, in the remit of the implementation of the financial sanctions. Now, this being linked, of course, with the impact of the COVID from an economic or from a health point of view, mm. all being linked, we need to look into what we can do for the future generation and to preserve the health of our future generations. We are providing direct assistance, so technical advice, technical support, to reforms in many member states in the area of health. For example, we worked with Belgium, Estonia, uh, Croatia, Greece, and Czechia on the digital transformation of the health systems. Um, in uh, Slovenia and Spain, we provide technical support to set up a, a telemedicine infrastructure. We contributed to the establishment of integrated multidisciplinary primary healthcare services in Austria, Spain, Portugal, and Hungary. We strengthened the public health, building up the capacity of the national authorities to combat antimicrobial resistance in Latvia. We prepared the ground for rolling out evidence-based cancer screening programs in Romania, Slovenia, Latvia, and Slovakia. And we work, for example, in France and Austria on sustainable solutions to tackle the shortages of antibiotics and to secure the production of medicines in Europe. And we strive also to incentivize member states working together mm. to face together the same challenges and to try and identify solutions that can work for all. Thank you, and that, that illustrates, I think, also the point that Commissioner Kyriakides made, which was that even respecting member state competence, the range of things that can be accomplished with this collaborative and supportive approach is, is very broad. We'll hopefully have the opportunity to come back. Now I would like to, uh, to move on to some of our other speakers. I think we've, we've heard so much about um, the Ukrainian situation uh, and in particular the challenges facing uh, Minister Lashko, the Ukrainian Minister of Health from both hands and from um, uh, and Stella Kyriakides. It's a privilege to be able to hear now from uh, the minister in a recorded address. Шановні учасники форуму, організатори, перш за все, дозвольте подякувати вам за можливість звернутися до вас і за підтримку, яку ви надаєте Україні і українцям. Нам дуже імпонує тема і формат форуму «Гештайм», адже українці сьогодні, як ніхто інший, розуміють важливість європейської єдності та партнерства, а також рішучості для здійснення кроків, які дійсно допомагають побудувати краще суспільство. Ми вітаємо практичність та амбіційність учасників. І нам дуже приємно, що саме Україна та її досвід стали одним зі стимулів до тематики ювілейного 25-го форуму. Сьогодні, після семи місяців війни, розв'язаної Росією, ми змогли вистояти і продовжувати боротьбу на всіх фронтах. Не буду приховувати, в перші тижні війни – з таким підступним та безпринципним противником, як Російська Федерація, важко утримати контроль над системою охорони здоров'я та забезпечити медичну допомогу усім. 
Близько третини населення країни тимчасово були змушені змінити місце проживання. Майже половина з яких залишила межі країни. В таких умовах ані медичні працівники, ані програми лікування чи лікарські засоби не встигають за своїми пацієнтами, що провокує переривання лікування або підвищений попит на певні препарати в аптечних закладах. Ми здійснили ряд важливих кроків, створивши вільний простір медичної допомоги, дозволивши не лише людям звернутися за допомогою незалежно від місця проживання, а і медикам, які покидали зону бойових дій, прийти і працювати в закладах там, де вони можуть бути корисні, без прив'язки до їх місця роботи. Цим ми дозволили медикам, що залишились, сфокусуватися на критичних видах медичної допомоги – екстреній, хірургічній, лікування опіків і травм. Значний удар прийняли на себе і країни європейського регіону. Це не лише надання медичних гарантій мільйонам біженців з України. Це прийом важкопоранених та хронічно хворих. Це покриття наших потреб там, де наша система не встигла переорієнтуватись. Гуманітарною допомогою, польовими шпиталями, а також бригадами іноземних працівників. Саме ця співпраця допомогла вийти зі стану шоку і відновити ефективну роботу системи охорони здоров'я. Саме це дає нам змогу говорити про відновлення, про плани, про євроінтеграцію України – та інші, більш довгострокові завдання, а українцям почати повертатись додому. Сьогодні ми маємо значно більший потенціал для відповіді, але разом з тим зріс і градус загроз. Від ядерної війни чи атаки на мирні атомні об'єкти до постійного терору енерго- і тепломереж напередодні зими. Ми це знали, але мали можливість підтвердити на практиці, що в Україні багато друзів які готові поставити свої власні потреби на паузу, щоб допомогти нам, розуміючи, що Україна в цій війні відстоює набагато більше, ніж просто власні кордони. Разом з тим, визначальну роль мали саме міжурядові та міжкраїнові механізми співпраці. Робота Єврокомісара та Єврокомісії, Європейського бюро Всесвітньої організації охорони здоров'я, екстрених інструментів, запущених спеціально для реагування на виклики. Шкода, що саме в такий спосіб, але війна в Україні здатна принести важливі уроки і для всієї Європи. Перший з них – наслідки війни чутно скрізь. Від хвиль біженців до розриву ланцюгів постачання продуктів харчування до банального питання енергоефективності приміщень лікарень. Це те, що відчувається за тисячі кілометрів від зони бойових дій. Другий – Захист здоров'я – це комплексний набір рішень, який йде далеко за межі власної системи охорони здоров'я. І ресурси для відповіді на подібні виклики здатні впливати на стійкість всієї соціальної сфери. І резерви для покриття нагальних потреб повинні бути а. наявні, постійно оновлювані та достатньо диверсифіковані, щоб бути розгорнутими саме там і саме тоді, де потрібно. Пандемія ковід була першим сигналом для усвідомлення важливості цього уроку. Війна в Україні тільки підтвердила це. Третій. Жодна країна не здатна протистояти загрозам сама. Точно так само, як допомагати справлятися з наслідками. Найкращий приклад – це система Медевак, яка показує весь потенціал взаємодії країн та зменшення тягаря на окремих партнерів. І останній. На жаль, ніхто не є повністю захищений. Такі загрози, як хімічні, радіаційні, які, здавалось, залишились в історіях про холодну війну, можуть в будь-який момент миттєво набути актуальності. І чим раніше ми позбавимось ілюзій, що навіть в сучасному світі це неможливо, тим більші шанси, що це ніколи не повториться. Але є і один позитивний урок. Ми дійсно здатні будувати ефективну взаємодію і навіть в сьогоднішніх умовах залишати пріоритет за здоров'ям. Наступним кроком для України, який починається вже сьогодні, але повністю набере свій потенціал після нашої перемоги, є відновлення системи. Незважаючи на те, що вже більше 141 об'єкту охорони здоров'я повністю зруйновано, а більше тисячі пошкоджено, наш план відновлення має стати і стане новим етапом розвитку. Відновлення – це дещо більше, ніж просто відбудова старого на заміну знищеному. Втрачений через війну потенціал розвитку 
і новий статус країни кандидата в члени Європейського Союзу ставить перед нами значно більші амбіційні завдання. Ми не просто плануємо відновитись, а і наздогнати втрачене і вирватися вперед. В технологіях, підходах до надання медичної допомоги, маршрутах пацієнтів, в медичній освіті, а також в ролі лікаря в системі охорони здоров'я. І це ще один надважливий напрямок співпраці, де ми хочемо співпрацювати з вами і очікуємо на вашу підтримку. Бажаю вам сміливості в дискусіях і діях. Разом ми переможемо. set of very powerful messages and that has described eloquently the challenges facing the Minister of Health of Ukraine. It's now my honor to welcome to the discussions two more ministers illustrate who can comment on some of these challenges from their perspectives um, of their own countries. Uh, Minister Leonora Gewessler from Austria and Minister Daniels Pavlut uh, from Latvia. And ministers, it's a pleasure to have you with us both. Thank you for joining us um, online. And uh, Minister Pavlut, if I may turn to you first. I, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the impact on your country and the Baltics of this war in Ukraine and what has been your response to some of these challenges, Minister? Uh, thank you, Nick, and, and hello, colleagues. Uh, it's, it's a privilege to be with you and, uh, and to speak after uh, our distinguished colleague, uh, Lashko, the Minister of, of Health of Ukraine. It's, uh, it's a pity I cannot be with you uh, physically in Gashta, and I was looking forward to it, but then it is what it is. Now, on your question, Nick, uh, well, clearly, we have been trying to help Ukraine as much as we could. Uh, we have been warning the collective West of, of Russia and, and the threat it represents for many years. And in fact, the war in Ukraine has been going on for eight years and seven months. It didn't begin on the 24th of February. It was just this uh, dramatic phase, uh, this uh, massive incursion uh, began in, in February. Now, Latvia, as well as Estonia, Lithuania, we've been among the leading countries providing bilateral help to Ukraine, particularly in military terms, but also in humanitarian and also in, in health uh, support. What we've been doing is, is providing treatment uh, in our countries uh, and rehabilitation to injured Ukrainian soldiers and, and other victims of, of hostilities of, of war, people that have been wounded in, in action or suffered from catastrophic consequences of, of Russian aggression. Uh, our countries have accepted large numbers, in Latvian case, about 40,000 Ukrainian refugees, and we treat them as our own. We provide them access to our health systems and, and provide whatever is, is necessary on par with our citizens. We have provided uh, medical supplies, uh, Minister Lashko mentioned, field hospitals. We, we sent a, a complement of, of field hospital equipment uh, uh, a couple of months ago, and, and uh, we have been also providing access to the Ukrainian medical workers, to our health system on, on, uh, on the basis of a streamlined and simplified eligibility procedures. Now, the, the willingness of our people to help Ukraine on, on multiple fronts has been exceptionally high since the beginning of this phase of the war. And, and this can be easily understood, given that uh, if you look at the map, now we are frontline states. We are frontline uh, states for Europe, for NATO. We have shared borders with Belarus and, and Russia, long borders. And we can easily imagine ourselves being in the place of Ukraine. Now, it is our duty to help Ukraine win this war in every area, and, uh, and they are actually fighting this uh, war for the collective West, for the civilized world, uh, world against the collective Putin. It's not just the Putin himself. So clearly there is not going to be a sustainable peace in, in Europe unless uh, collective Putin uh, goes. 
So, and in my mind, as I guess in, in many minds, Ukraine is already winning. It's just a matter of when this is comes to an end and, and when Ukraine restores its, its sovereignty within its borders. But let me say one more thing that it's not just about helping Ukraine win, it's also about learning from Ukraine. And I think that many of us have a lot of things to learn, particularly, again, us, the frontline states. We are traveling to Ukraine on, on, on study missions, closer and closer to the front. Our medical workers go there, and, and, and we learn from how they operate in, in these um, uh, conditions of war. How can we make our uh, preparedness levels better? How can we deal with inevitable, uh, inevitable um, uh, disturbances that, that war brings uh, to medical systems? How do we cooperate uh, with military medicine from the perspective of civilian medicine? How do we bring our CBRN readiness? Unfortunately, we have to talk about that as well, the, the nuclear uh, threat as, as, a, as a hypothesis at least. How do we bring our readiness levels up? So this is two-way street. It's about helping Ukraine win, but it's also about learning from, for, from Ukraine as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And thank you for describing that um, very broad range of response and the, ch the challenge uh, that still faces all of us in uh, relation to it. Minister Gwessler, um we've heard already in, in the introductions to this session about the multiple dimensions of this PERMA crisis. Dr. Kluger referred to the importance of One Health, and this will be the topic of the uh, plenary tomorrow. As the minister responsible for hugely important policy areas such as climate and energy, mobility and technology, a, a very broad portfolio, can you tell us how you are working with colleagues across government uh, to address the negative impacts from this PERMA crisis on health? Thanks. Um, thanks a lot for the introduction and listening to my colleagues and the previous speakers. Um, the level of the PERMA crisis and the multifaceted problems we and challenges we face in this moment became really uh, crystal clear. And um, if you want to take two indications, you have a Minister of Health on this panel who speaks as much about war and foreign policy as health. And you will have now a Minister of Climate Action and Energy who speaks as much on social effects of climate policy and health effects of the climate crisis. So I think if you want to take this as, an, as, a, as, a, as a signpost, um, or not as a signpost, that's not the good word, but as a, as, a, as a signal of what mm. um, times like these demands of us policymakers, decision makers, people in responsibilities, is to really think outside borders and to, to get out of, of silo thinking and to really uh, try to grasp and work with the complexity and the interlinkedness that this crisis demands of us. And in, in my case, um, of course, there's two aspects of, um, of this situation that challenge me most in, in policymaking. The one is obviously the war in Ukraine, which has come back in again and now again with a very strong statement from um, the Ukrainian minister and the effects it has both in the Ukraine and, and on Europe on our security of energy supply, as well as uh, on the social aspects of, um, of the, 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 the price hikes that we see. Um, on the other hand, um, I think if, if there is people who have not um, yet grasped what the climate crisis means for health, then I think this summer was maybe a, an, another stark reminder from um, young people becoming increases, increasingly anxious. Um, there's even um, the, a word by now for it, the climate anxiety, because um, that's about the climate crisis is about a very existential threat to their well-being and lives, to old people who don't dare to leave their homes anymore because our cities have become so hot that it becomes actually a health risk to their well-being leaving their houses. So um, to answer your question, if the, the situation is as complex um, and multifaceted, then our responses need to be as well. And we try to do that in two things, on an institutional level, in uh, trying in our ministries to also embed 
the questions in our thinking and doing. So for example, our Ministry of Health and Social Affairs has implemented a competence center for health and the climate crisis or climate crisis and health effects. And in the Ministry of Climate Action, we are working on a just transition uh, process that uh, embeds the thinking of what do just and healthy jobs what can we do and what does climate policy have to do with just and a just and healthy transition, uh, healthy and good paying jobs and uh, all the questions that we need to look at in, in other sectors than just, I put it in quotation marks, environmental and climate policy. So we try to do it in structures and we also try to do it in content. So when we uh, work on climate action measures, we, we always try to uh, look at the uh, social side of things, so really um, make the, the, the policies we do fair and just on the social side. Or if you look at the immediate effects of the, um, of the energy crisis and energy price hikes, you have a, a very adverse correlation. You have people who, um, who don't have a lot of money, who usually live in bad apartments, hardly insulated apartments with bad heating systems that also have health effects then. They are at the same time the people who have the most trouble meeting their household bills. So when we do a support scheme or a subsidy scheme for the energy prices, we pay specific attention to the lower income bracket to make sure um, they, um, we enable them also to, to face this challenge with a special uh, funding to lower income households um, and special provisions for, for those who have the hardest time to manage the situation. So not, not easy times at the moment, but also uh, a positive challenge for all of us to think outside of the silos. And I think the forum that we are all attending now and that you are organizing is a key example for that. Thank you very much, Minister. And, and indeed, I'm, I'm very struck by, as you say, that the breadth of issues which both of you as ministers are considering and being forced to consider. Um, and Minister Pavlitz, I'd like to, to come back to you because one thing is what the extent to which you bring him on board these issues. And the other thing is how this works across government as a whole. Um, and briefly, if you would, as we are, we are slightly behind time, um, how are you working with colleagues across government to address some of these, these multifaceted issues that we've just been discussing, particularly around, for example, the cost of living crisis and things like rising food and energy bills? Yes, Nick, certainly this, uh, this is something that I am as a member of government in all, involved with uh, very much. Now, for the last few years, due to pandemic, the health has been the top priority of the government. Now, these uh, priorities are, are much broader than that. Well, health is still there, but, but, but energy, climate, as well as, as inflation and uh, military preparedness, all of these are, are sharing the center stage. Now, we have been working as a team. I mean, how, however multifaceted, ideologically diverse our government is, this winter, there are two top priorities. Help Ukraine win the war, and second, get through the winter. And, and, and trust me, we are united. We will get through it and we will be there to help Ukraine however long it takes. We will not be split. Our support will be um, unwavering and I hope this will be the case across Europe. I trust it will. Let me make one central point here. Uh, a little bit echoing on, on what my colleague, Gvers uh, Minister Gversla was saying. Now, it is not necessarily so that we should be looking at an uh, agenda that we are now setting to help our uh, communities survive the winter when we cap the energy prices or, or we think about uh, substitute energy sources. This does not necessarily, at least not in our country's case, have to run contrary to the climate agenda or the long-term sustainability of our societies. Now, whatever is happening in our country is not uh, you know, coming back of coal. It is actually a massive boom of investment in, in renewables on a large scale and on, on a micro-generation scale. It's an anecdote, but I'm installing a heat pump myself and putting you know, panels on the, on the roof. And, and many middle-aged people are doing, sorry, middle-class people are doing the same with government subsidies uh, across our country. So 
What I'm saying is this crisis, this, uh, this perma crisis or multi-pronged crisis of pandemic plus uh, plus war uh, and and an energy crisis is actually bringing about uh, benefits in terms of spearheading, spurring mm. on some mm. of the agendas and, and policies that, that have been lagging behind for quite some time. Thank you, Minister, both both for the the contribution and also for the. There's an element of optimism there. There's a spur to change and a, an element to take things we've been talking about and really turn them into action, which is part of what Clemens, you, you said, is you know, we, we, this should be a positive. There should be grounds for optimism from this session as well. Minister Gwessler, as, again, as, as, as briefly, if you would, in your field especially, there is a real tension between the short-term cycles of politics and some of the, the very long-term challenges which, which you're facing. How do, how do you reconcile that and, and what can we do to help politicians in, in reconciling that tension, do you think? I can build on something that my colleague Pavlos now said, because I think in times of, of crisis, what do you normally do in a crisis? You analyze the situation, you get the priorities right, and then you act. And I think getting the priorities right in a situation like that is it must be our central guideline. So also for us in, in Austria with a historically very high dependency on, on Russian fossil fuels, so um, different starting point from, uh, uh, from my colleague, the priority, number one priority is get over the winter. So that is a priority for the whole of government to make sure we, we do give every bit of security also for our own population that we can give at this moment. And the second priority is go to the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is our dependency on fossil fuels and especially our dependency on Russian fossil fuels. So if we get the priorities right, then it's very clear there's two different timelines for this. The winter, short notice, I will need every kilowatt hour that I can get to make sure that I can heat homes in case Vladimir Putin does what he does now, use gas supply as a weapon. In the longer term, and to go to the root of the problem, we also need to start working now, but the only solution there is to go renewable, to go as independent as we can, to produce as much of our energy ourselves as much as we can. And this means uh, from uh, every, we, we get rid of our dependency on fossil fuels, solar panel by solar panel, heat pump by heat pump, windmill by windmill, and terawatt hour by terawatt hour in the end. And so the good news is really that this situation, as serious it is, as it is, and as much, um, as much pressure it puts on our societies, it also sparks a movement of action in, mm. I can do a contribution myself to make the situation better. We have record uh, applications for the subsidy schemes for renewables, for the, uh, the heating system exchange. So 2022 will be an absolute record-breaking year for renewables installation in Austria. It will be a tough marathon. Getting rid of the dependency and really working at the root cause is nothing you do in, in, in a year uh, or even in two, but, um, but it will take a lot of endurance and, um, and, uh, and staying, with the, staying with the priority, but we will make it. And 2022, we are off for a good start. Thank you very much. Again, not only for the contribution, but for the optimism and the, the sense of a, a possibility there. Ministers, we are, thank you so much. I, we've had such interesting contributions that we are slightly short of time, so I will thank you there and, 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 and let you go with those very positive notes on, on, from both sides. Um, In a, in a moment, I will come to, um, to my colleagues still uh, here for two final 30-second uh, final messages because we need to close the session, unfortunately. But I, I have to, before we close the session, we need to see some cartoons and I, I need to, to hear what's been said. So I'm going to do this in reverse order, if that's okay. I'd like, Nicolene, what kind of messages have we, have we had from participants during this session? Well, thanks, Nick. Um, lots. Uh, people have been very engaged, um, especially on Twitter. So let's try and sum up um, some of it. Um, there's been a lot of talk about glasses being half full and half empty. 
uh, from different sides. And if something came through really strong, um, is really that we have to make sure that whatever and how much is in the glass needs to deliver for everyone. Hmm. Um, so we shouldn't have serve, we shouldn't be serving empty glasses to some and full and nutritious glasses to others. That's not a good idea. So, so that's basically what we've been getting through Twitter. Um, also um, important to generate new ideas and action, not also to prevent crises, otherwise we're just mopping up um, you know, um, water that, that comes at us. And um, while trying to do that, I think um, people told us it's important, I think WHO calls this a dual track approach, uh, so we have to do crisis, work on the crisis, but also meanwhile, uh, all the other things that we need to do. And people on Twitter especially said, please also focus on things like health promotion and prevention. It gets a little bit on the side when you just work on crises, um, uh, psychosocial approaches, etc., and avoid silo thinking. Uh, which is something that we've heard many times in, in the Kurzaal, cool, cool as you know, but it's, uh, it needs to be said time and time again. And just to close, um, um, and apologizing to everybody for the rich um, input and me not sharing it, it's just too much of it. Um, I think one of the issues that got a lot of attention on the Q&A on Slido was the la dilemma was about um, uh, how we uh, regain trust, um, you know, in also in fighting fake news, um, that on one hand there could be a need for more evidence, but on the other hand there's also really a need for more action, because just talking about things doesn't deliver for people. So I feel that that's also something that came through. So um, I think that's my best bit of, of briefly summarizing all the input, thanks. Thank you, thank you for condensing the richness of what I know were very detailed uh, um, and manifold contributions into a very short summary there, Declan, thank you very much. And so, there is, yeah, you can see, see the work cloud of some of the, uh, so we have up there, what aspect of the perma crisis worries you most? Um, I think what this illustrates is just the sheer range of, of issues that people are, uh, have seen as the challenges. It's a very different list from previous gash times, huh? Yes. This is not what we would have previously seen. Can we see Floris's cartoon, um, please? Yes, uh, in the, yes, I, I, I can't imagine what the symbolism of the bear is at all. Um, uh, and, uh, and the and independence uh, of, of the EU, I like that. Um, I don't know if there are any other cartoons uh, to share with us. Yes, the knock-on effect, if I'm allowed that pun, Floris, um, of all these different crises, one on the next and on the next. I don't think I need to say anything about that one, really. I think that one speaks for itself. I think we're going we're to have to stop there for the, uh, for, for the time being, sadly, I think, in, in, due to time. And um, we'll perhaps leave that one up there as the backdrop for two very, very short final comments, if you'd like to have them, and I'll take you in reverse order. Natalie, what final thought strikes you? Well, thank you very much. I think you need, we need to be united. We are united in diversity uh, and united in adversity. And in DG Reform, we're working on a project that is going to be very important for the future of the health reforms in the member state, which is the one on the resource hub for sustainable investments in health. So this is a project which is led by three member states, Austria, Slovenia, and Belgium. We will facilitate member states' access to all the satellite of funding programs in the EU. And I believe that with this, we will be united, we will work together, to facilitate the health transformation in the EU for the benefit of everyone there. Thank you. Thank you. An excellent initiative. Um, and a final word, Abigail, from you. Just, I think just to say that um, I think we have to keep in mind that everybody, no matter where they live in the world, deserves to have access to healthcare and deserves to have access to a healthy diet. And the policy actions, the decisions that governments take in the global north fundamentally affect uh, what happens in the global south. 
And we need people like those in the room and online, as I said before, to really keep championing that point and to ensure that the actions of governments and indeed the private sector don't continue to fuel this fundamental inequity. It's that inequity that drives what we're seeing today. Um, so please, we need champions for that. Uh, and let's keep the concept of healthy, equitable food systems central to our minds. Thank you. And <laughs> Colleagues, We've heard of an enormous amount about challenges, but we also have optimism and we have a clear set of values, I think, Nicolene, that was one of the also things, things that came across clearly from the feedback within the room. And we are in a space of enormous richness in terms of our exchanges and our ideas to help address those. I hope this session has helped to give you input for the future sessions in considering how to do that. And I hope you will join me in thanking all of the speakers and contributors to this plenary session. Thank you.